Hare Krishna Maharaj, humble obeisances. Thank you very much for joining again for the Monks podcast. A pleasure, uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's more than what we share with others. I feel myself very enlivened and illumined by your association. So sometimes I feel this Monks podcast is my excuse for getting association of devotees. So I'm grateful that you're spending the time, Maharaj. I think you've been doing it with many, many devotees, uh, right? Yes, man. See, recently, maybe because of the lockdown, many Vaishnavas have ag- agreed to come forward. So I had done with with Satya, uh, with uh, Garuda Prabhu recently, then Anuttama Prabhu, and then Bhakti Marg Maharaj, Rudyanand Maharaj, then uh, also with um, Jaitaj Jay- Maharaj I did long ago. Then some younger devotees from second generation. Yesterday I did with two, in fact I had two yesterday. There was Sri Nandan Nandan Prabhu, Stephen Knapp. And I also did with, from India with Bhakti Vinod Maharaj. We discussed a little bit about the history of Indian outreach and analyzing what was, what worked, what did not work. So he's also quite interested in Western outreach. That's how we bonded. So it is, it is coming up quite well. But I think uh, among all podcasts, uh, our podcasts have been consistently regular and um, they are quite widely viewed also. So I'm grateful to you Maharaj for sparing the time. I think these intellectual uh, discussions are necessary where we probe, analyze, discuss uh, various topics of interest to, to all of us in the modern day and age. Yes, Mananj. Uh, to apply bhakti uh, in the modern age, uh, how to uh, you know, adapt changing circumstances mm-hmm. whilst performing our devotional services faithfully. Yes, Mananj. There are so many uh, aspects that need to be discussed which need churning. Yeah. So... I think it's good that this journey process is going on. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. The, I thought that could, that could be the basis for our discussion today itself, you know, with respect to modernity and bhakti. So is bhakti anti-modern or pro-modern? And so I did a little bit, is that okay? We could discuss on that subject, Maharaj. Yes, yes. Yeah. So basically, I look at the definitions of modernity and some of them may not apply immediately to us because technically many people say that the modern age ended with the 1930s or the Second World War or in the 1960s and now what they have is postmodernism. But in other cases, the, it's differentiated between pre-modern and modern and postmodernism is still considered like within the broader subset of modern. And in India, I think we can say postmodernism is coming, but it's like in the rural areas, modernity is also not reached. And in some urban areas, postmodernism is also reached. So it's a flux. But broadly, when I look at modernity, what, what are the aspects that could possibly intersect with bhakti? So I made a list of a few, and maybe we could discuss on them. So... Broadly, there is modernity associated with change in economics, change in society, change in politics, and change in individual individuality. So that means change in economics means the economy moved either from feudalism or agrarianism to more of capitalism. Of course, there's capital communism also, but capitalism has become more, or it's called as a free market economy, that is the economic service. Then from a, uh, from a social perspective, it was a shift more from, from say rural living to urban living. Not everyone, but at least it is aspired. Then sect in politics, it was a movement more from monarchy of various kinds toward democracy. Again, it has not necessarily happened, but that's what is aspired for. And within individuality, 
it has moved from more like hierarchy toward equality so that everybody is equal and there is everybody is entitled to freedom and equality before the law that kind of things and the last factor which probably would be the most important for us is that in the uh, in the religious and cultural aspects there has been a consistent questioning if not rejecting of tradition and if there is not again a rejecting of religion but there is at least a relegation of religion to the to the private domain from the public sphere so the public sphere will be non religious we have discussed secularism earlier so there is within within all of these there are subtleties because although religion has gone down the idea of spirituality has come up and spirituality is associated more with individuality rather than a collective whole but these are the five broad aspects so did you have means are these something which you would like to discuss or you like to take in some other direction no i'm fine with this uh, uh, but just some opening remarks based on uh, what you said yeah i think the distinctions between modernism post modernism etc i would think it's more technical for the purposes of our discussion mm. uh, although there are there are some differences which is why post modernism is has a evolved as a separate category in the eyes of many but as far as we are concerned uh, anything that is contemporary current that is, that relates to uh, our times the present times or to recent mm -hmm. times is what we would consider modern right yes i mean from a broader point of view uh let's say 20 years down the line uh the think post modernism may evolve into some other form morph into some other form hmm and but for us 20 years then that will be modern okay so i'm i'm referring to modern more in the sense of contemporary you know, contemporary okay whatever the prevailing contemporary philosophy that is what i would mm. refer to as as modern uh not getting into the technicalities of yeah uh, i agree Modernism and such things, because our concern as devotees is to see how we can deal with uh, and adjust to ever-changing situations in the environment. Mm -hmm. the, the world outside and its values are changing very rapidly, and yes. the pace of change is also is is increasing. yes that is true so some uh in this rapidly changing environment we as devotees have to adjust on yeah. one hand we have a philosophy we have a way of life we have a culture but we have uh a situation which is rather incompatible in the sense that we are living in the midst of society of a society whose norms and mores and values are changing very fast yes so so i would say that as the society is moving from traditional to the modern okay uh, certain values have emerged which are uh, which are primary so you yeah. mentioned uh, most of them uh, one is the the primacy of the individual yes whereas the tradition focused more on the collective yeah uh in the modern day the focus more is on the individual and therefore the clamoring for rights individual rights that is supposed to uh, responsibilities or it's not that in the individualism wasn't valued yeah but uh, the focus today is excessively on individual mm. so the primacy of the individual then there is also the emphasis on unbridled freedom of speech and expression and people okay. don't like any limitations or any restrictions to be placed on that okay yeah also 
uh, egalitarianism, which you mentioned, the you know the equality, which is bridging the gap between mm. um, people and making them more or less peers. Yes. So the idea of subordinate and superior is is uh, getting <laughs> the difference is getting erased and diminished. Yeah. Yes, my wife, that is true. So in this egalitarian kind of an approach. Uh, yeah. And also then, of course, uh, the critical inquiry. You were mentioning about how they want to examine religion or anything, any entrenched belief from the past. Yes. to see the critical eye. Yeah. So I would say th these are the issues that we need to really grapple with. So I think I'm fine to go along in, in, the, in this direction. Yes, Maharaj. This is a good framework. Rather than looking at areas, we could look at values. Because because in a sense, for us as individual devotees, we, we can't really do much about, say, the political change from one, from feudalism to democracy, or from maybe industry, from we can do some things, but not much about the change from agrarianism to capitalism or industrialism. But the individual values, we can deal with them one by one. And uh, so I think we could take that approach, Maharaj. We can look at some typical modern values and see how we move forward. Just one point about the difference between modernity and postmodernity, which we could address or which we could keep in mind that modernity was fueled by the strong hope of technological and political progress. The idea that in the past people were primitive and we are going to become better people, not just better technologically, but humanity itself is evolving towards becoming better. That hope was very strong. And postmodernity has replaced that with cynicism, not even skepticism, but cynicism. That, you know, that actually whatever we called as progress, that was just a construct of some people and society has not actually progressed or society is not progressing. And that rejection of tradition is even more vehement in postmodernism. But this idea of that technology will lead to unadulterated human good that was punctured by the, especially by the second world war, which led to a lot of technologically fueled or technologically uh, brought about destruction of human life and property. So maybe we could start with uh, your framework. Yeah. That, uh, it is uh, interesting that uh, in the modern era, hmm. by the modern era, I refer to the post-industrial revolution era. Uh, Post the modernism as we define it is more or less a 20th century phenomenon okay. uh, because technology primarily uh, strengthened in the 20th century it started in the 19th but 20th century it became very strong and focused so it's and with that certain uh, approaches to life certain values mm -hmm. certain philosophies emerged uh, which involved critically questioning tradition and to yes. a large degree, even rejecting it. Now, the moment critical inquiry progresses in its, by its natural momentum hmm. and values, they move on. What happens is that they tend to eat into themselves. Okay. They eat themselves sense that they evolve in such a way that whatever were the values that they espoused at a, at a certain generation, that same trend of thinking then rejects the earlier trend of thinking. Yes. And a series of philosophies emerging, each of which critiques and rejects the philosophy that came prior to it. And I think the, the best example of that would be what we are seeing now. I think in our previous podcast, or maybe the one before that, you briefly mentioned in the opening remarks about uh, cancel culture. Yes. Right? And in the cancel culture, they're basically uh, 
coming down heavily on people who make statements or who act in a way that uh, certain people find very, very objectionable. Yes. And then they go to very great extents to actually uh, denigrate them in such a way uh, that they lose their reputation. And they also take action to ensure that they lose their livelihood. If they're yes. professors in an academic institution, they make sure that they don't get their contract renewed. Or if they're writing a book or have a speaking assignment to make sure it gets canceled because they badmouth that person so much. And interestingly, the victims of this, at least many of them, are themselves those who are liberal minded. Yes, yeah, so it's the word they use is woke. This is called the woke. Those who have awakened themselves to say poor contemporary values or postmodern values. And uh, saying among at least conservatives that you can never be woke enough. You may be woke today, but by tomorrow's standards, you will be considered still primitive. So there is an astonishing amount of pr or presumption of moral superiority that no other people are as moral as we are. And even uh, venerable people from the past, their good deeds are overlooked and uh, the, their moral flaws are highlighted. That's why in America, there's been breaking down of many statues of even say there's a statue of Abraham, Abraham Lincoln and he's freeing a slave. So and that's, that uh, statue was built by blacks. But they're saying that, that he freed the slaves is not the good thing, that he thought that I am doing something benevolent by freeing the slaves. So that was the idea that he's freeing them. That was a gesture over there. They said, this is who, who is he to think that he can free? And they saw that as a symbol of the slavery in America and they wanted to, they, they, tried, they destroyed that basically. So that presumption of moral superiority is astonishing, actually. Yeah. So we see that those very same thought processes, mm -hmm. that very same mindset that began in the late 19th century and strengthened in the 20th century, that focused on rejecting tradition, lock, stock and barrel, mm -hmm. you know, at each generation, that is leading to a philosophy that rejects the previous one. And this is going to be a continuous process. So those, yes. those who call themselves postmodernists now, in the next generation, they will be rejected by the others who come up with a, a newer philosophy. Yes, So, ma you know, we, we are as, you know, we are in a situation where there's a constant storm of evolving of philosophies and there's going to be no end to it because mm. that is the nature of intellectualization. Yes, Manoj. Of blind uh, material intellectualization, too much of uh, rejection of uh, standard uh, spiritual beliefs and principles mm. can only result in more bewilderment and continuous rejection. Yes, Maharaj, that's true. And generation is going to feel like the way you've mentioned now, that they're going to have a sense of moral superiority over the others, and the others were wrong, and we are more liberal than you, we are more this than you, and, and that's how it's, it's going to move. Mm -hmm. So for us as devotees, the concern is that we don't get blown away or swept away by these uh, ever-changing tides of uh, contemporary philosophies, you know? Yes, Maharaj, that's true. So at any point in time, we are, we, we are going to be under pressure to conform to contemporary ideas and beliefs and practices. Yeah. So I just... The pressure will be because in one side, we have some traditional principles and values, and the other side, the need to have some affinity or be relevant to the modern situation at whatever time period is going to cause uh, tension. Yes, Maharaj, that's true. So just, just to reiterate this point of uh, unrestricted 
uh, rationality or unrestricted questioning of authority. Uh, I read an interesting essay by Tamal Krishna Maharaj. He described the history of Western civilization in these terms. He said that in European history, there are primarily three main movements, roughly the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. There was a Renaissance, then there was the Reformation, then the Church, and there is the, the Scientific Revolution. And then basically they say that the, the seeds of modernity were sown in the Renaissance. And they started fructifying from the scientific revolution onward. So he said that the Renaissance, uh, Renaissance so prior to that, this world was seen primarily as a place of test and transit. We are living in this world. Jesus said this world is like a bridge and we are meant to go to another world. And in fact, many thinkers have said that one of the defining differences between pre-modern and modern thought is the importance given to another world as life's ultimate destination. In modernity, that idea has been more or less rejected. This world is where we will progress and where we'll create heaven. So, so Renaissance said that this world itself is a manifestation of God's beauty and glory. And so the idea of how this world is to be seen, there's a significant amount of world acceptance and rejection of the biblical view of the world as a place of test and trouble. Then, so, uh, so the verdict about the world was questioned. Then the reformation was where the authority of the priests to interpret or to, or their monopoly on explaining the world, that was questioned. And there some Protestants who said that, we will, uh, every reader has the right to uh, read the Bible for themselves and interpret it. In the past, because printing press is also not there, so people couldn't read much. It was mostly they would go and hear. So they said ev every reader can interpret the Bible. So that for first was rejection of God's view of the world. And this is sim oversimplified, but then, then, then there was a question of, there was a rejection of God's representatives to explain the world explain God's word. So then now Protestantism exhibited what you said. So there are currently between 55,000 to 75,000 Protestant denominations. And they keep, because there's no authority, they keep, uh, keep morphing into more and more. And then the scientific revolution, when it came, it questioned God's existence itself. So God's view of the world is questioned first the power of God's representatives is concerned and then the existence of God itself is questioned. Now, not everybody in the scientific revolution were atheists, but the point was that, that rather than depending on God for humanity's upliftment, it was seen that we humans can lift ourselves up through our rationality in thinking and through our technology in living. So that rejection, rejection, it seems to be a Rejection of authority seems to be a, a defining characteristic. Now, this is not always bad because sometimes there were superstitions, there were oppressive power structures, but just as uh, blind faith is problematic, so blind, uh, blind skepticism is also problematic. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Um... Ati Sarvatra Varjayet. Okay, yes, that's true. Ati Sarvatra Varjayet. Of anything should be given up. Mm. Ati means, you know, an excess. Sarvatra means always and everywhere. Varjayet means one should give up. So I think what has happened is that certain noble values like uh, freedom of speech, like critical inquiry, you know, like uh, uh, individualism, you know, the respect for the individual and dignity of the individual. These are all very noble values, which any enlightened uh, civilization or society should have. And as far as it, the, from the bhakti point of view, this is definitely given. It, it is there, you know. Uh, our Vedic scriptures are also uh, indicative of that. Mm. Critical inquiry, that is, you know, in, now you inquire into the absolute truth. 
So definitely these are, these are values that are also enshrined in the Vedic literatures and in the Vedic culture. But when these things are carried to an extreme, without an anchor, without a reference, merely mm -hmm. on the whims of uh, mundane intellect mm -hmm. and uh, on mundane wrangling, Mm. Then you end up in an endless, you know, downward spiral. Yeah. And you go into uh, an interminable uh, phase of rejection after rejection, rejection after rejection of anything that came before you. Yeah. So it's because there is no anchor there. So it's the difference of degree. Yes. You know, there, all these values are, are, are cherished in the Vedic culture, but now as the society becomes uh, more and more quote-unquote quote modern, as time is passing, the degree of these things that they want, that they want is mm -hmm. increasing day by day. And that is what is causing the problem. So going to the other extreme, for example, the, the important point you made about rejection of authority, uh, Srila Prabhupada said he, he encouraged uh, being independently thoughtful also. Hmm. You see, the, the harmonious, uh, shall we say, coexistence of surrender to a spiritual master on one hand and to Krishna, Mm. And on the other hand, being independently thoughtful, you know, they are reconciled very harmoniously in the bhakti path. Yes, so there is scope for expression of individuality, there is scope for free speech, there is scope for inquiry, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's reconciled, there is a healthy reconciliation that is possible within yes. the fold of bhakti. You know, but when you uh, come out here, the authority, you reject the authority completely. And then you're left with no anchor. Yes. But there is a problem when authority is abused. That, that is, a, is a major problem, undoubtedly. And that has been one cause, uh, an important cause for the rejection of authority. Yes, Maharaj. But to throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah, not going to help. Yes, my this is like avoiding excesses. And this last point about the values, they are there in our tradition also. See, one of the problems with the modern approach is that within the modern worldview, which often tends to be to be materialistic, non-theistic, within the modern worldview itself there is no basis for the values that it considers sacred. Say, for example, equality. Uh, we may say that we believe people are equal, but if we are just machines, biological robots, then what is the basis of equality? If you look at IQ, you look at EQ, look at any parameters, people are different. So in fact, the way materialism moves forward, we all believe that we have freedom. In fact, freedom is a very cherished value. But as materialism moves forward, more and more the idea is becoming fashionable among mainstream scientists that we have no free will. That actually we are just products of our um, of biological programming. So in a sense, uh, there is this disconnect almost like a cognitive dissonance that certain values we consider sacred, so freedom or equality, but they have no basis in the very foundational worldview. So uh, I, Einstein said that, you know, there is science and there is scientism. So Einstein said that if I were something, I'm paraphrasing that, if I accepted science uh, completely, if I accepted scientism, then I would have to believe that the Nazis, Nazis were not responsible for the Holocaust because they were just programmed that way to hate and to kill. And 
one more this self sabotaging problem is that uh, we all need a moral compass and at least some understanding of what is right and wrong that may vary and where does that come in modernity from so in the past it came primarily from religious scriptures in the modern times people think that they will get it morality can come from rationality but it's not that simple now we may rationally know that some things are right but still we may not be able to do them or for that matter rationality may lead us to certain things which may we can rationally justify them but they are morally unconscionable in fact say the whole idea of uh, the holocaust was at that time germany was among the most progressive scientific uh, progressive in science and eugenics which said that you know, some races are superior to others and we want to evolve the most superior race that was um, based on the prevailing science of its time not that all scientists subscribe to it but rationally that was you know you could make a case for it similarly you know much of the what is called as a planned parenthood with respect to what is called euphemism for abortion that movement the the woman who's i think elizabeth singer who started that in a private letter she said that actually this is the way we can remove the blacks from our society and she was very explicitly racist and that's a very problematic statement for people because they said blacks won't be able to maintain themselves and another very graphic example of this is this was in the journal of bioethics that there is one atheist philosopher who took this reasoning forward and he said that that uh, if a mother wants she can abort the child after he is born also and it led to such a vehement opposition to him and in the comments online and everywhere and he said you know all these arguments are sentimental he said and if and all these arguments can be applied even to the child in the womb from the biological perspective the location of the embryo doesn't determine its status so uh, uh, so then you know morality so rationality alone cannot give rise to morality so in that sense although modernity thinks of itself as progressive but some of the founding values they, they cannot come from a modern world view any thoughts on this maharaj yes it is this uh, thought process this kind of thinking that leads to the logical conundrums that you have just referred to Mm -hmm. the fundamental point is that if your foundation is ever changing then everything that you construct on top of that will also be fleeting and liable to collapse because mm -hmm. rationality is based on uh, human understanding and intelligence just uh, on its own strength Mm -hmm. so the conceptions of what is rational and what is irrational will also change with time they oh, yeah they are different according to the different conceptions and perceptions of different people mm -hmm. so what is rational to you is not rational to me now what was rational to one generation may not be rational to another generation so understandings of rationality will change with time and because they are based on the flickering and the ever changing material intellect and conception of life so mm. therefore whatever construct that you have based on that rationality will also be ever changing it cannot be steadfast yeah it can be stable and steady so if you build a whole system of morality purely on rationality it cannot sustain yes It cannot endure so no. therefore as i mentioned earlier you have a, a rudderless anchorless kind of a boat that's being tossed around in the waves of an ocean the the ocean 
uh, of material existence has innumerable waves mm. and all these waves are of different types and of different magnitudes and they all represent uh, in this if you can make an analogy in, in this uh, context that the different thought processes different ideas sometimes there is a a wave that comes from this direction sometimes the stronger waves come from from another direction because of the wind blowing this way and that way mm. and a boat that is not strong enough that simply gets tossed around here and there you know a sailboat so similarly if the individual is not moored or anchored in something that is permanent that is enduring something that is changeless then everything that the individual constructs at a physical level mental level you know behavioral level cultural level at all levels will be constantly changing hmm and it will lead to constant bewilderment constant rejection where rejection uh, becomes the norm yes maharaj that's true so the need for basing our thought processes our rationality even our logic our values our morals you know on scripture which is the steady bedrock of everything is all the more required yes maharaj of course you know just to speak from a different perspective to some extent the rejection itself has uh, its values in a sense when we started uh, trying to spread our movement started spreading in the west it was if people had not rejected the judeo christian values uh, which were prominent at their times then there would not have been this interest in eastern spirituality so and uh, in general when people explore something new in india india spirituality is not new but in the rest of the world it was new so it is to some extent because people were exploring based on rationality and from a rational pers- rationality cannot give ultimate answers conclusively or exhaustively but if from a rational perspective it could be that some traditions uh, can have a more rational explanation of life than other traditions and in that sense uh, if uh, if there was complete adherence to t- tradition then then the possibility of outreach and the spreading of bhakti would also have not been possible so rationality needs to be given its due but as you said avoid the excesses sometimes uh, in the context in which you mention uh it is the question of giving up one tradition for another okay so it's not rejection of tradition per se but rejection of a particular tradition because that answered more of our questions hmm and gave more comprehensive answers to the important questions of life yes maharaj today however uh see even those devotees who came from other religious backgrounds even if they were religious when they accepted vedic culture or krishna consciousness they mm. accepted the tradition that was formally you know unknown to them that was alien to them when they came in touch with it uh they did not all sail reject everything that their previous religious tradition stood for for example they did not give up the idea that there is a god they did yeah. not give up the idea that we must realize that god hmm. they did not give up the idea that god has created this world you know but it is just that they got a more elaborate convincing and comprehensive explanation from the bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam etc yes whereas what is happening today uh at the non spiritual or non religious level is a wholesale rejection of tradition the good and the bad yes there are certain aspects of tradition which uh, 
could be adjusted because merely because something is tradition it doesn't mean we should blindly accept it either mm mm-hmm. so one time i think some years ago we were talking about this about having enlightened tradition yes yes enlightened values so uh the wholesale rejection the blind wholesale rejection of tradition is what i'm questioning there are certain aspects of tradition we may number one reject completely if they're not in line with guru sadhu shastra from our point of view mm-hmm. number two we may adjust or compromise with certain elements of tradition for the sake of the highest goal of bhakti either for our, our own practice or for the propagation of bhakti mm-hmm. so uh, but if the rejection of tradition is based solely on quote unquote rationality then then leads to a problem then that leads to atheism yes that's true and no and, and no matter what kind of uh, morality or values you attempt to uh, create on the platform of atheism is going to drive us to all these logical conundrums yes that's true as echoing what you said maharaj prabhu pad would sometimes say that in the west that i have come to tell you what you have forgotten so it's not so much give something new but that what what you have forgotten prabhu pad would sometimes say it's god so we may wait be giving or we were giving maybe newer or broader understandings of god maybe some newer ways of linking with god but in principle or in essence it was something which is universal across various traditions yeah hmm. so so maharaj shall we move to specific value i think we are already discussing rationality to some extent so maybe we could take this forward and then we could move to other values like equality or individualism so rationality with respect to rationality primarily applies to say on one side the development of science which leads to technology which could be a separate subject but science leads to say particular theories and particular ways of looking at the world which may or may not be compatible with um, with uh, uh, with tradition with the bhakti tradition particularly now so with respect to rationality many of the biggest questions now atheists may say that it is unscientific to believe in god and theists may say that it is scientific actually you can scientifically prove the existence of god but broadly we could say that on these kind of questions rationality will never be uh, will be never decisively conclusive hmm? like we say shastra yonitva the vedanta sutra says so for existence of god or existence of soul we can give reasonable rational pointers for how these are how these are possible so where would rationality uh, really come in conflict with bhakti would it come uh, would it come anywhere at all or we could always bring about a harmony so we have a dictionary definition of rationality you have access to a, a just quick, yeah sure a quick search yeah because these are technical terms so so better equipped can you see that we have the definition yeah so here it is i shared my screen the quality of being based or on in, in accordance with reason and logic now say that again. the quality of being based on or in accordance with reason or logic hmm. now if i go to wikipedia and go on go on read it okay rationality implies the conformity uh of one's beliefs with one's reasons to believe and of one's actions with one's reasons for action 
and to determine what behavior is the most rational one needs to make several key assumptions and also need a logical formulation of the problem so it's primarily based on logic or the let's just go to the first line i think that much is enough for us what is the first line of that definition based on logic and reason right yeah that it is where where our thoughts and actions are based on logic and reason yes. and the, the cambridge dictionary defines it as the quality of being based on clear thought and reason or making decisions based on clear thought and reason right okay so now uh so when we say being rational we say it's something that is based on logic and reason yes and logic and reason are traits of the intelligence yes ability to analyze and understand things uh reason to reason out things to logically analyze things is a trait of the intelligence now from a purely intellectual point of view or a so called rational point of view there are an infinite number of explanations that possible to give for any particular phenomena right okay you know one could say just about anything uh now for example one could say that the apple has fallen to the earth because the apple wanted to fall or because the apple didn't like the moon or you yeah. know one could make any number an infinite number of explanations each of which in and of itself is rational but it is when you put all these rational statements together are you and you make a comprehensive composite uh, you know consistent whole that you get a philosophy or you get a belief system and then all these uh, statements like the apple fell because it didn't because it wanted to fall then we we reject such statements because it doesn't fit in to other ideas then it is yeah. not really a, a a a reasonable philosophy yeah so rationality basically because it based it is based on pure intelligence it cannot again be the sole reason for us to to uh, achieve our goals in life are uh, the true mm-hmm. goals of life you know from the spiritual point of view because ultimately anything material will not give us uh, perfection in and of itself mm-hmm. if intelligence is a purely material intelligence is used then it will not give us perfection but if that intelligence is dovetailed with spiritual knowledge if that rationality that uh, logic that power of reasoning is done in accordance with scripture then that is perfect yeah utilization of reason and logic and that's what kaviraj goswami says in the chaitanya charitamrita also mm. <clears throat> so i think we are not against logic per se uh, we are not against rationality per se we are against these things being employed independent of scriptural conclusions yeah i think this would be for those who are rationalists yes marriage for rationalists this could be a problem because they consider rationality to be the supreme authority and they would want to subject even scripture to rational scrutiny and they may accept certain aspects of scripture that are rational that they think are rational and there are certain aspects of scripture which are which they would consider as not rational and they would reject that and in that sense rationality will become a authority higher than scripture for them so sometimes i differentiate between three levels that there is rational there is irrational and there is trans rational so so irrational is which is, is where where that which does not stand rational scrutiny but trans rational is where rational scrutiny itself doesn't stand 
because the subjects are so expansive that rationality itself does not work and this positive positive of transrational is itself not necessarily irrational because you know, anybody who works in a creative field for example say einstein himself said that the intuitive mind is the real discoverer i'm paraphrasing and the rational mind is a mere ser mere servant so for example the phenomena of inspiration which leads to major breakthroughs in all fields especially science which is considered as eminently based on rationality so inspiration is not based simply on a linear rational progression of from what i know to what i now know what i knew to what i know it is a sudden leap which sometimes it is it is a cognitive leap in understanding that comes suddenly but the the rational basis for that may take decades to be arrived at like gauss proposed things which which were accepted and used but the proof came decades after he passed away gauss was a electrician electrical scientist so so in that sense we could we could talk about uh, scripture accepts rationality but scripture also recognizes that there is a domain of reality beyond rationality that's the transrational yes and i think it is not rational to assert that this is not possible yes so rationality could be associated with humility in that sense yeah there is there is no rational reason to posit that the reality there cannot be a section of reality or aspect of reality that is beyond our power of rationality that is beyond our intellectual and sensory examination mm. to posit therefore that reality is what my senses perceive uh that reality is limited to the range of my power of reasoning hmm is does it necessarily uh hold water it uh, it is not in and of itself a, a rational thing it doesn't necessarily pass the test of rationality so why why should the universe be such that it should only come within the grasp of your power of reasoning and rationality yes maharaj so it is an irrational assertion to make that there is an aspect of reality that is beyond the powers of our senses and the power of our reasoning yes maharaj and this because is... our power is based on the senses and the power of the senses is limited so our reasoning power is also limited because it's based only on the senses and and the mind and the intelligence yes my this is true you know in western intellectual thought there were in, there were thinkers like kant and uh, hume and others so this is a active discussion so what happened was there are some rationalists who said that only the rational is real and that led to a wholesale rejection of religion and god and all those things but there there were other thinkers who said no there could be all these which are beyond the domain of uh, rationality but the result of that was and they said that the rational is what we can mutually agree on even if there is something which is beyond the domain of reason that is the you experience something you believe something i experience something i believe something that would be different for different people and what these thinkers did was they tried to create space for religion within the age of reason by shifting religion from the public sphere to the private domain so the idea is okay you have had some experience you have certain beliefs that's fine for you so religion became more of a subjective experience than an objective reality so any thoughts on this maharaj yes uh you know at the end of the day if if one really goes 
uh, deeper into that, everything is ultimately a subjective experience. You know, if you really want, you know, if they really want to go deeper into it, <laughs> their so-called rational understanding of the world is also a subjective experience. <clears throat> is there? There's sub- it's, it's only that their subjective experiences agree. That's all. That is their understanding of rationality. So if they define rationality, how, how, yes, Amit, can you just explain this? Say, for example, if I measure this, <laughs> and say this is, I say it's two inches. Yeah. So now, is this a subjective experience or is this a this is objective reality? Independent of what I say or you say. So what do you mean by everything? It's still your experience. No, but you can also have the same experience. You can, experience. you can also take a scale and you can measure it and you will find the measure to be the same. So I'd like to understand what you mean by this. Yes. It is just that the subjective experiences of many of us coincide because we come from the same frame of reference. And so we, we call that as rationality. So, if you define which we all commonly agree upon, because we observe something, but our senses, as we as we know from our our basic Krishna conscious uh, teachings, our senses are imperfect. We have a tendency to be illusion. We make mistakes. <laughs> we mm. have a tendency to cheat. Okay. So, at the gross physical level, what we agree upon is relatively easier to deal with. Okay, yeah. But when you start getting into a domain that is increasingly out of range of your sensory perception, either at the macro level or at the micro level, then Mm. we have problems. Yes. In fact, to reiterate, actually, yeah, Sorry? just to reiterate this point, actually, yes, not just beyond sensory experience, even the essential sensory experience, it's not objective, in the sense that when the age of science started, science decided to divide divide observed reality into what they called as uh, objective and uh, primary qualities and secondary qualities. So primary qualities are those which are measurable. Like I mentioned this, he, the, the length, breadth, velocity, viscosity, luminosity, all these. So those which you can put a mathematical measure to, they call those as primary properties. And everything that could not be put a mathematical measure on was called as secondary. And science systematically subordinates or neglects all secondary properties. So even within sensory experience, Say so when we eat food, uh, the taste of the food, that is not a mathematically measurable. So I may say this is delicious and you may say it's okay. So I might say this painting is astonishing and somebody else might say it's mediocre. So I agree with this point that, or I, I'm emphasizing on this point itself that uh, even sensory, the sensory experience, the essence of what we look at is not the mathematical parameters. It's taste, smell, uh, the visual appeal, and so of the form, the visual appeal. So all these are not mathematically measurable. So in that sense, a strict rationality, a, a strictly rational or other here, again, these are big philosophical subjects, objectivity and rationality, what is their relationship? But as you said, the domain of the pure or purely objective is so limited that we humans couldn't live in that domain. The the completely, the starkly objective domain uh, without any subjective experience is not the world that we live in. So many of our, so if a person A falls in love with person B, then A finds the person B lovable but a mother finds her baby eminently lovable and is ready to give up anything for that baby. Some other woman may not want to do that. But and this is this subjective experience is often the basis of our human relationships. And it is also critical for human society. So I agree the objective reality is not the complete reality. 
I agree with you on that part, Maharaj. Because you see the fundamental is based on sensory perception and the extensions of the senses. And among the senses, I also include the mind and the intelligence. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there is bound to be a defective conclusion. There are bound to be uh, mistakes, you see. And as I mentioned earlier, rationality is easier to deal with or to accept when it is in the realm of everyday affairs. Okay. But when you go, you know, into more rarefied realms of, of uh, reality, hmm. which are not so accessible directly by our senses, then where is the question of rationality? <clears throat> yes. Where is that common meeting ground? That common meeting ground is also on some rarefied stratum of, of <laughs> some speculation or some inference or something like that. Mm. So the point is that if sensory perception, if intelligence, if the mind are trained to <clears throat> uh, express themselves and function on the platform of scriptural teachings, then they will attain perfection. Mm -hmm. We are not denying sensory perception or rationality or intelligence or the function of the mind, lock, stock and barrel. We are not rejecting that. All we are saying is dovetail that with the conclusion of the scripture. Yes, Maharaj. So, let the rationality and the logic and everything be based on scriptural logic. For example, uh, Prabhupada used to say, right, that uh, use your science to prove that God exists. Hmm. In, in, include. So the, the scriptural conclusion is that there is a supreme intelligence behind this creation. So now we use our rationality to understand how that is so. We use our logic and intelligence to establish how that is so. So that is <clears throat> how okay. uh, I believe uh, rationality and logic and intelligence have a role in our life and we're not rejecting it. <clears throat> but I think we're more or less deviating from the main theme of our... Yeah, from modern... Which is, you know, Bhakti is a pro anti-modern. Yes, Maharaj. So if we can just get back to that, uh, I think we, we went on the, in this direction because uh, the, the point came up about how modern philosophies uh, were based on critical analysis of tradition mm. and on the subsequent uh, rejection of tradition because they were seeing everything in the light of rationality and yes. uh, the functioning of the, of the intelligence. That's how we came to this point. Right? Yes, and we yeah. started talking about rationality. Yes, Maharaj. So, so <clears throat> now coming back to the question of bhakti in the midst of this turbulent ocean of ever-changing and mm. uh, conflicting philosophies of life. You know? So if we come back to answering the question of bhakti, is it pro-modern or is it anti-modern? So in the light of all that we're talking about now, can we uh, come back and assess this topic? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. One way we could say is that <laughs> bhakti is, bhakti is trans-modern because it is eternal. So it is the connection of the soul with the Supreme and it transcends all temporary historical phenomena. So, but within modernity, we could discern some things which are pro-modern. So some things which can actually facilitate or help in the growth of bhakti and some things which could uh, impede the growth of bhakti. So I think that uh, instead of making a generic statement of bhakti and modernity, we need to look at specific elements of modernity 
and how they interact with bhakti but in essence bhakti is not modern bhakti is not ancient bhakti is not medieval bhakti is transcendental and bhakti can be uh, the soul's longing for the divine is something which is which is inherent to the soul and in that sense it can manifest in any historical milieu hmm. yes <laughs> yes exactly uh the word modern or ancient mm. you take that to be the acronym for uh modern mm. uh, are essentially temporal constructs right by temporal yes. i mean uh, time related yes related to the phenomenon of time mm. uh whereas bhagavad gita for example if we take that as the standard book of spiritual wisdom is not so related to time in the sense that uh, the, the basic principles of the bhagavad gita don't change with time yes so and we read that in the bhagavad gita itself where krishna says he first spoke to the sun god uh, he spoke to the sun god you know millions and millions of years ago uh, he spoke to them uh, vivaswan the sun god spoke to his son manu millions of years ago mm -hmm. you know then chaitanya mahaprabhu spoke this 500 years ago prabhu pad spoke this about 50 years ago right so the essence of all that was spoken is the same so that has not changed so as you rightly said uh, uh, we cannot say we cannot use terms like modern because time in the material world is limiting yes uh so any temporal construct will be limiting hmm. and impose the limits of such a temporal construction on something that is eternal hmm is not valid yes therefore to say whether bhakti is uh pro modern or anti modern is something that is uh not appropriate it's not appropriate to talk about such things however here uh i'll just make a i'll i'll just make a distinction between philosophy and culture uh, okay. and, uh, and maybe maybe we can look at it in the light of philosophy and culture if we look at philosophy as our um foundational understanding of the reality of of the nature of reality of the nature of the self of the nature of god uh, and of the interrelationships between these then we can perhaps call that as uh, philosophy okay okay and the uh, manifestation of philosophy at the level of the mind the mental attitudes uh of behavior of lifestyle all that we would call as culture okay okay and so because culture ultimately reflects the philosophy of life right yeah uh philosophy finds expression in culture and culture is a reflection or a manifestation of philosophy at the yes. mental physical behavioral level okay uh now for each of these uh, i'll say uh there are philosophical principles that are eternally valid so they are not under the influence of time say like for example we are the soul eternal soul that's okay. a philosophical principle that we follow we believe in krishna is the supreme personality of godhead hmm he is the origin of all the material and spiritual worlds the material world uh, goes through a cycle of creation sustenance and destruction the spiritual world exists eternally beyond the realm of the material world hmm right these are certain things that we as devotees understand and firmly believe to be true and valid at all times 
the whether it was millions of years ago whether it is now these things are true right hmm. now so even in the modern era the post modern era pre modern era they're all true so now if you use the word is bhakti you know pro modern or anti modern then one could also interpret that to see whether the beliefs of the foundational philosophical beliefs are also in alignment with modern understanding okay and yeah one could apply a similar test to the cultural aspects yes so yes. for us these philosophical principles are eternally valid and there's no question of subjecting it to the uh, temporal criteria like ancient or modern yeah but nevertheless people today may not accept that there is a god yes or even if they accept there is a god they may not accept that krishna his name is krishna or you know or they may not accept that the material world is created sustained and destroyed and the cycle goes on eternally hmm so the principles of the philosophy of bhagavad gita uh, for us are eternally valid but to what degree does the modern world accept these philosophical principles hmm i guess you could look at it in that light whether it's pro modern or modern as okay. one way of looking at it another and the same argument or the perspective could be applied to culture yes so whether the attitudinal or mental or the behavioral aspects of culture the lifestyle aspects of culture are in alignment with uh, the modern understanding or or beliefs right yes maharaj i think this is we, what we did is initially we started with say maybe analyzing modernity and what its components are to see how much they are in harmony with bhakti now we are in some in some sense analyzing the components of bhakti and then seeing how modernity would view them so i would yeah. say that yeah so as far as the philosophy is concerned so the existence of god the existence of soul uh, existence of uh, even say that the cyclic understanding of the universe basically i think the essential pro- propositions of bhakti would be that there is a soul there is there that we are essentially spiritual and eternal and there is a supreme eternal divinity and there is a relationship of love between the two so we could say that a rational case can be made for all three of these not all rationalists will accept it but it's it, nobody can actually dismiss these as, as irrational because we have a longing for eternity and how do we explain that from a biological perspective the or from a scientific perspective that longing is is very much there and similarly there is a search for ultimate reality and also the longing to love and be loved so i think we could say that the core truths of bhakti we could make a make us not just a reasonable but a strong rational case for them if it was required and the more sorry you see that uh, they do not many or by they i mean many people would not accept that to be rational because in their thinking this is not logical it is not provable from from their point of view not scientifically validated so even though we may present it as being rational which we do in the when mm. we present krishna consciousness we always present it like that yeah but many people today may not accept that the modern yes. thinking the modern thinking largely today yeah does not accept that also although there is a section that is interested in spirituality in the west it's coming up you know into meditation and all that mm. uh, but to what degree Uh, will modern thinking overall as a category align with our bhakti principles philosophical principles is mm. something we don't know yes and, and then, uh, 
the alignment is is naturally especially in the last many years the alignment is is not quite good because yeah. modern thinking differs substantially with our philosophical principles you know why yes, many people do agree there are many people who don't agree yeah similarly with the cultural aspects also we have the same difficulty yeah so actually i agree, i fully agree with you that you know if we talk about some some organizations they call themselves as rationalist organizations and often the rationalist is just a more acceptable way of saying atheist so yeah. many of the rationalist organizations are atheistic but uh, you know, just as we cannot make us we if you say that somebody can't make a very strong case for uh, a case that will be widely accepted for theism then actually one cannot make a very strong case even for atheism although in the mainstream perception it is thought that to be rational means to be atheistic but it's not that simple because rationality doesn't necessarily lead to uh, any decisive conclusion about the nature of ultimate reality so rationality so in that but i agree with you that so we could say that as devotees we do need to considering modern 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 thought processes the first way we present ourselves is make a rational case not a scriptural case in the pre modern times we could just use scriptural authority so to present to reason toward a certain conclusions or to but we will need to approach to rationality and so in that sense it is we don't accept rationality completely or don't accept the conclusions that are as of an associated with rationality but the process of rational thinking is something which would be indispensable for us if we want to communicate with the with the broad variety of people who call themselves as modern yes and that is precisely how shri prabhupada presented it yes if you look at his conversations and even his lectures he emphasized the the uh, rational or logical aspect of belief believing in the soul yes you know, the dehino spinyatha deha verse you are changing one your body is always changing where is that body when you were a child you had one body now you have another body you change your body so there is appeal to reason there is appeal to logic there is appeal to the intellect mm. when prabhupada was present in consciousness you know even when it came to uh, belief in the scriptures he made a logical or a rational case for it like you know when you want to know a child wants to know who his father is the best way is to ask the mother so the mother mm -hmm. is like the vedas so we understand who god is because that is standard information an authoritative source so he uh, reasoned out things mm -hmm. so he, he never started his lectures simply by telling people you must believe in this because it's there in the bhagavad gita eventually he did but he made a case for doing that so I come back to the original point i made earlier that uh, you know we are not against logic we are not against rationality we are not against the use of intelligence mm. but all we are saying is align it with the teachings of the of the vedas of the bhagavad gita yes then that leads to perfection because you have your anchor okay so by align what exactly do you mean that means use the rationality to understand these truths or consider the consider to understand the bhagavad gita's truths or align means subordinate so align what what exactly do you mean by Util align means utilize or subordinate or both. Both. In the beginning, we align our uh, intelligence and rationality to to understand the truths of Vedic statements. Okay. The soul, the existence of the soul. So we understand the logic. 
we understand the need to believe in the scripture yeah of course logic and reason are not the only ways we can develop that shraddha the shraddha comes from other people who have shraddha but that's another topic is another principle yeah but we have to go through this whole process of exploration of discovery of probing of inquiry right yes so ma'am. then see men all of us who come to bhakti we go through this whole process yes someone explains to us whether it's in prabhupada's books and or someone else gives it to us in a personal discussion or a lecture about why the soul exists and then you know we become convinced about it and then our faith increases as time goes by yes um, so by aligning of the intellect and our reasoning capacity and our rationality uh, with the vedic teachings i mean that we use these faculties to understand the truths of the vedic statements hmm and to develop some degree of faith in them so that we can begin the practice of devotional activities which then strengthens our faith further and then we begin to use logic and rationality to present this to others and to establish it in the eyes of the world okay so that they also see it as being logical and rational and reasonable hmm say for example the belief in god which is more rational that uh, the, you know something came out of nothing or something came out of something yes or the, let's say everything came out of nothing or everything came out of something yes that's true which is more so, rational yes maharaj so make a case a rational case as you yes. said so i think uh, we could apply this principle that we used about rationality for other values also for equality or for say freedom now these are important but we cannot absolutize them absolutizing them would would basically lead to them self destroying so we could go in that direction briefly and look at each of these values if you want maybe for a few minutes or we could go in that other direction which you mentioned about culture because for most people when they think about modernity they think of more in terms of modes of living you know maybe the the houses in which we live the kind of roads we have the kind of dresses we wear so modernity is more associated for most people in terms of lifestyle culture uh, those things rather than thought processes so do you want to discuss uh, the thought processes a bit more or should we go to values na, go go to the cultural aspect you know in my understanding uh, culture has two aspects an internal aspect and an external aspect okay the internal aspect uh, would comprise uh, the beliefs the values the attitudes okay yes mindsets the ambitions the desires yes you know all of it uh and that is based upon the philosophy of life so right okay. i spoke yeah. of philosophy and culture they said culture is the manifestation of philosophy yeah yes so the philosophy are the found is the foundational understanding of reality of yes. self god etc that is reflected first at the subtler level in attitudes mindsets ambitions desires you know aspirations etc and then those attitudes and mindsets and desires then are reflected at the gross level at the external level in terms of our lifestyle in terms of our behavior and so on okay so the internal and external aspects together comprise culture that is the way i would understand it okay yeah just uh, taking this point forward now so you know the so we could have uh, philosophy is more at the domain of thoughts and attitudes 
if we can broadly classify that what people think of culture is more in terms of practices although there is an internal aspect which arises from philosophy but there may not necessarily be a one to one correspondence that this philosophy would necessarily lead to this culture say for example in india itself broadly there was a spiritual philosophy that everyone accepted everybody accepted that that there is soul there is god but at the same time within the indian subcontinent itself there is a remarkable amount of diversity and this was there even if we consider the times of the mahabharat where the different kingdoms had uh, different modes of living modes of even modes of worship so in that sense we could say that even if bhakti is associated with certain philosophy and uh, that philosophy uh, can express itself through varieties of cultures it needn't be just one culture even the bhakti culture in say maharashtra is different from the bhakti culture in karnataka or different definitely different from in bengal or uttar pradesh so maybe we could look at a uh, culture as more like a not one culture but like a cultural circumference so what aspects of bhakti culture um work well with modernity and what aspects of bhakti culture uh, we may not be able to we may have to ins- we may can we may have to insist that for practicing bhakti culture we may have to uh, we may have to create a distance from modern norms right uh, before that i just like to clarify that when we speak of philosophy and culture mm. i don't mean these to be mutually exclusive categories you know of uh, course they're actually one integrated whole okay so like bhakti we have a bhakti philosophy but we also have a bhakti culture yes and that you know say humility humility is it culture is it philosophy it's both yeah because uh, our the bhagavad gita our vedic teachings teach us both uh, the, the the foundational theoretical principles they teach us the subtler aspects of the internal culture and they also teach us about the gross aspects or the external aspects of that culture it's all yes, one right. integrated whole mm. yes. okay and therefore uh, and also within that the cultural aspects will be uh, as you rightly said expressed differently in different lands in different eras yeah what the basic principles will be same yes broad principles at least yes my that's an interesting point so of course philosophy and culture are not two we could say non intersecting holes non intersecting circles with a causal link between them but they are not exactly identical also say for example we could say advaitavadis and bhaktas both may culturally worship the deities but their philosophy is quite different so there would be some aspects which could fall which so we could say it's more like a venn diagram where there are two circles there are major intersections but there are some things which may fall more in the domain of philosophy and they may be outside the domain of culture and there will be something which may focus more on the domain of culture and fall more in the domain of culture and may not be in the domain of philosophy but definitely they they are connected they're not not completely disconnected in fact i would say go to the extent of saying they are an integrated deeply uh, interwoven kind of their phenomena you know they you really can't separate philosophy from uh, culture many times you know <coughs> i will give the example of humility now is humility uh, only an external behavioral thing okay i get where you are coming from maharaj yeah humility at the subtle level of culture or is it also a philosophical principle yeah i agree with you maharaj okay maybe then you mentioned the word cultural expressions so i was thinking of that in terms of cultures so humility we could say is a universal human value 
but you know we might express it by folding our hands i say japanese people might express it by bowing it up, bowing at the waist or somebody might actually physically bow down or somebody might salute so now we could call these as different cultural expressions or we could call these as different cultures itself because japanese culture and indian culture are different so in that sense when i was talking about from one philosophy as a circle we could have different cultures coming out but maybe we could use the word different cultural expressions coming out yeah okay. yes yes that's right one could alternatively also use the terms principles and details okay yeah yeah the principle being the essential feature of something hmm uh, a fundamental feature of something so the essential or fundamental feature of something could be the principle yeah and the way the essential or fundamental principle is expressed or finds expression mm. at the mental physical and social level etc you know or at the level of time place and circumstance that you could call a detail okay yes. so for example let, let's take the case of humility since that point came up that humility is a principle hmm okay yes. it is derived from another philosophical principle that we are insignificant we are tiny parts and parcels of krishna we are not the controllers we are always controlled and therefore there is a strong ontological and philosophical basis for acting humble <laughs> yes right so humility is a philosophical principle it is also a cultural principle at the level of the mind and then <coughs> to the prince the humility is a principle it's a cultural principle it's a philosophical principle it's okay. even a behavioral principle but the detail is how you express that humility hmm you may do it by bowing down you may do it by offering obeisances by folding your hands by uh, by your words you know right yes maharaj now just to complicate this a little bit when we talk about a principle it may not necessarily be associated with one philosophy alone say for example the scientific sci scientific world view often they argued that sci the scientific world view fosters humility more than the christian world view because the one of the arguments there was christianity considered humanity to be special that the earth is the center of the universe and humans are meant for deliverance and the scientific world view says that actually we are just evolved animals and the ego that had separated us from the rest of the world so that is destroyed by science so now whether this reasoning is true or not is open to question but the point is that uh, there could be different philosophies which also lead or claim to lead to certain values so so that means there is a philosophy within philosophy there are many aspects there are there are statements about the nature of reality but there are also statements about how we how we approach that reality so within philosophy there's ontology ontology so ontology is the nature of reality and then we there is another field ethics now how are we meant to behave in nature in relationship with reality so that's just to nuance the subject but i think we can move forward and so you were talking about diverse cultural expressions yeah so you know i'll just make a comment on what you said now mm. uh that scientists also uh you know assert that by study of science uh they have become humble because yeah. the study of science would necessarily lead to humility yes you know for for what by whatever uh, reasonings they do it mm -hmm. actually it should because when you look at the vastness and the complexity of the whole universe uh, every intelligent person should become humble right hmm. and realize how insignificant you know we are individually in the midst of this gigantic cosmos 
and how incapable we are of grasping anything and how helpless we are, right? And the coronavirus thing is showing us that. So that kind of an intellectualization or rational, a rational approach can lead us to become humble as it should. That is a proper use of intelligence. Okay. So we can become humble by this form of reasoning. However, uh, the point is that material rationalization and uh, the intellect cannot lead to a sustenance sustenance of such qualities okay for a, your intelligence cannot it can make you humble for a time being but it cannot keep you humble and ensure that you will uh, attain to the perfection of humility whereas the spiritual approach is not only do you intellectually understand your position, philosophically, ontologically, and therefore you understand you must be humble, but by taking to spiritual practices, you actually become humble in course of time as you advance spiritually. So mm. it is not merely a, an intellectual approach. So you actually, you actualize okay. what is an intellectual conclusion. Yes. By spiritual practice. Whereas by the purely intellectual or scientific approach, it just remains an intellectual thing. And if some scientist does become humble, it's more because of his sabhava, his fundamental nature of being in the mode of goodness or something like that. Yes. Uh, yes, rather than just on the strength of uh, the scientific philosophy. Yes, Maharaj. I think this is one major lacking in Western philosophy that most of our modern Western philosophy or even little pre-modern, it has been divorced from any systematic practice that I may posit this or that, but there is no means for purification and transformation. So just the intellectual reasoning is not enough to transform. Yes. And our, our philosophy gives us a set of tools by which actually the heart becomes purified and then, even if I intellectually understand, I should be humble. But to purge the ego or the pride from the heart, that's not just an intellectual process. That's more of a purificatory process. And those resources are important. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. And to look at it from the point of view of Bhagavad Gita philosophy, even if a scientist is very humble now, you know, because he is by his scientific studies, he has come to that conclusion, mm. which is good. But there's no guarantee that he'll continue to be humble in the next life. That would depend a lot on his other karma and many other things. Okay. That, that will sustain or not. So, uh, such conclusions inter that are driven by intellectual considerations mm. are not transformational and they are not sustainable. Hmm. Whereas uh, spiritual uh, values, or the spiritual approach will not only actualize them, it will transform the heart and it will be sustainable and eventually it will become an eternal thing. Yes. So when that verse says, Hara va bhakta se kuto mahad guna, it does that where are the good qualities and those are not devoted. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have any good qualities. It means that their qualities are not going to be sustainable. They are there today and they may disappear tomorrow. They are superficial. Yes. Because they are not in connection with the Supreme. Yes, that is true. With yes, spiritual Maharaj. reality or spiritual knowledge. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. So we, maybe we can come back to this is a important detour we had, but so there is philosophy and there is culture. So I was mentioning the point that for most people, modernity, they evaluate and they perceive it in terms of certain cultural aspects of, uh, of dress or technology or comforts. So if we look at that aspect of modernity, so in one sense, we have the principle of Yukta Vairagya where technology can be used. So would you like to elaborate on this aspect? Of uh, the modern aspect of the modern uh, understanding 
of culture as being largely external relating to dress and the yes. other external things so again uh, chaitanya charan prabhu i would come back to my original point that the the lifestyle and the behavior okay are ultimately expressions of our attitudes and mindsets so what you are saying is this if i if i may rephrase it let's so if address. yeah so if i understand what you are saying is that bhakti is more about inner values and if those inner values are there then the appropriate cultural expressions will come out so rather than trying to evaluate or evaluate or legislate particular cultural expl- express expressions we can focus on educating so that the proper values come up yes so i just basic philosophical uh, framework or uh, foundational uh, teachings hmm. you know who are we who is god you know starting from all of that that will eventually change the mindset or the mentality of an individual which in turn will will change its uh, external expression yes maharaj i remember long ago many years ago you had mentioned this to me that say for example modesty in dressing that was a universal principle the specific dress that people might wear in different cultures might have been different but basically a dress that properly covers the body in a dignified way so you could say that so so that is the cultural value we are talking about yes so so the specific ex- expression is not so much a matter of issue it is the fundamental value yes but that value will express itself in the externals yes so coming to dress for example let's relate it to the internal exp- the internal uh, value so okay. in the beginning of our discussion we spoke about um the uh, individual you know the individual expression the primacy of the individual right okay the modern modern culture modern philosophy basically gives inordinate emphasis to the individual and to individual rights yes isn't it? so when that becomes your driving value then it automatically finds expression in your lifestyle and your externals then okay. you will say well it's my right to dress the way i want i can do whatever i want i can eat whatever i want i can dress in whichever way i want why should anyone question me on that why should there be any restrictions on that so the 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 lifestyle is an indication of what's here what's in our mind okay so the modern uh, see in the before uh, this modern emphasis on the primacy of the individual became dominant there was modesty of dress in the traditional cultures of the world hmm okay but the moment the the, the value shifted and emphasized the individual inordinately disproportionately then the individual started thinking like that well i am the most important person is all about me i am not worried about society i am not worried you know uh, it, it doesn't really matter social mores social norms they are not so important for me it's about it's all about me i want to dress the way i like i want to eat the way i like right hmm therefore these uh, the lifestyles and the behavioral aspects of culture are reflections of the mindsets and the mindsets are what they are because of the philosophy of life that they have which may be agnostic which may be atheistic which may be whatever hmm so the root is the philosophical education and we go there and we teach krishna consciousness in his basic elements and gradually people start understanding how to what to eat how to eat how to dress how to not dress you know all these things will automatically come isn't it okay yes uh, it's like uh, again uh, we it's not trying to cut the weeds we try to first of all uproot them or understand you know what are the seeds that are causing these weeds to come up 
and we go to the root so yeah so there are some something healthy about modernity something unhealthy about modernity but instead of simply evaluating that because that can lead to the conflicts over infringement on people's freedom so instead of simply talking about freedom and debating that we can go at a fundamental level and ask what is freedom meant for see is freedom itself the supreme value as is freedom meant to do something of value and then if if through the bhakti philosophy we establish what is of value then uh, a regulation of freedom so that that which is of value could be attained that will become acceptable but if we directly focus on you know this should not be done this should be done then it can backfire so i think this is a what you are suggesting is a much more uh, 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 approach which is subtler but it's also likely to be more uh, appealing to to people who are influenced by modernity to not let their modern perceptions come in the way of their at least open mindedly exploring bhakti yes so if you have the philosophical understanding and then you have the external cultural expression yes there is an intermediate stage of the internal cultural expression of okay. the philosophy that is where sometimes there is a gap so that devotees may also then maybe dress in a certain way or or act in as you know to wear uh, so we have to explain some even a devotee may argue well what's wrong with me going out and let's say eating in a restaurant or something you know what's wrong with that mm. so that means there's something there there's some some gap there is a lack of internalization right so if if somebody is dressing in a certain way let's say then why is it so why is that person dressing in that way there is a, a philosophy there's a mindset that goes with it right so maybe if it's a devotee also let's say that the the devotee is has is a nice devotee chanting 16 rounds or maybe it has faith in krishna but there is a disconnect the external cultural expression you know of dress or food habits or something there is a disconnect somehow <clears throat> so there is a gap <clears throat> so therefore these discussions on uh, the cultural aspect i think will be important for us also okay so what you are saying is that if the external cultural expression is is say radically divergent from what is the norm and then although that person is also accepting the philosophy then that's where the internal cultural values may not have actually developed or may not be blossom may not be there may not be there that way or well, there may be a lack of appreciation for that or a lack of appreciation of how that <clears throat> or the how that external thing connects to the philosophy the inability to see the connection okay i mean why why is my way of dressing uh, you know connected to my devotion to krishna so uh say if somebody is very inappropriately dressed and says that well it's just about me thinking about krishna but i can just chant you know okay so by inappropriately you don't necessarily mean mean a particular say like a indian dress or inappropriately means immodest then then we come to the issue of principles and details okay i make it makes sense as much as philosophy has principles and details the culture also has principles and details right okay yes say for example dress is a prince that has principles there are principles 
speaking to dress. That dress should be sattvic. It should be the mode of goodness. It's a principle. Yes, Maharaj. Now that principle may be expressed, you know, in in different ways. Hmm. So uh, when it's expressed in the temple, then we have one kind of dress. When it's expressed, when uh, let's say a grihastha is going to work in the office, so th- that person will have to wear, uh, you know, what we call karmi dress, maybe trousers and shirt or something. But that has to be sattvic. Hmm. So if they are going for a marriage ceremony or something like that, there might be a slightly different dress, maybe a yeah. more festive kind of dress. Okay. Yeah. So when I meant inappropriate, I meant not sattvic. Okay. Or if somebody uh, is is dressed in a very unclean way, that is tamasic. Okay. So the principle of one of the principles, another principle of dress, because it's connected to sattvic, is cleanliness. Hmm. It should be presentable. It should be uh, clean. Yes. So these are the principles of dress and the detail is whether you're wearing a dhoti kurta or whether you're wearing a trouser, you know. At the same time, I want to say, since we're on the topic, that as a detail, it is not important. We should not confuse details uh, and importance. Something may be a detail, but it's still something very important. Interesting. Adjust it according to time, place, and circumstance. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, it's still very important because it has a bearing. It, hmm. it, it does affect us. It does affect our consciousness and so on. Yes, Maharaj. So, a devotee was telling me that uh, uh, their children who have grown up. In the West, you know, they they feel embarrassed when their parents dress in in uh, you know the dress like dhoti kurta or a sari or something. <laughs> Why oh. do you dress? Okay. Because they feel you know they feel embarrassed or awkward that their parents are dressing like that, and there could also situations when uh, the parents feel like that about their children. I, I know one devotee who was complaining that his parents complain when he wears a dhoti. Oh, that's interesting. And the Indian parents, yes, they complain. So, so there are there are uh, situations. So there is some clarity needed on on these. You know, the details, the principles, the internal external expressions of culture, and how they tie up to the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And then how it all eventually relates to uh, being pro-modern or anti-modern. Hmm. Someone may see wearing a dhoti kurta as being anti-modern. Someone may see it as being cool. Someone may see it as being traditional. Yeah, you know, it's, that's true. So, you know, Maharaj, could we say say that? By these sort of the kind of discussions that we have had, these are meant to provide individual devotees tools for practicing bhakti in modernity. That rather than saying that bhakti and modernity are fully agreeable or fully opposite, what we say is that we need to understand what what is what is bhakti, and then we. We appropriately practice bhakti uh, within the modern context. So yes. there are some areas in which conflict might be inevitable, but we don't want to maximize the conflict unnecessarily. So when we understand that, certain, like you said, particular the, the details, they could be they could be adjusted. So we can avoid unnecessary conflict, but we can't uh, uh, we can't. Uh, Compromise on bhakti principles in order to avoid con- avoid a conflict with modernity. But through such discussions, devotees can get the resources, some some thought intellectual resources we could say, 
by which they can individually navigate their journey through modernity and if we have that sincerity krishna will provide the guidance from within as krishna says tadami buddhi yogam tam enama upayanti te so in specific situations a devotee may have to turn towards krishna in the heart okay how do i behave in this situation what do i do in this situation but um, so would that be like a some concluding you would like to give something concluding maharaj or you want to speak something more yeah i mean it's a nuanced thing you no know? uh, how to practice bhakti uh, in the modern age and there are so many areas of interface with the outside world you mm. know as any of food area of entertainment area of, you know so many things so we are influenced <clears throat> and affected by the outside world because we're living within it uh so how does that interaction take place so to what de- to what degree do we need the internal and ex- uh, external expressions of culture to safeguard our uh bhakti you know, mm. so these are things and to what degree is the deeper understanding of the philosophical aspects also integral to the protection of our bhakti hmm when and what to what degree uh, can the cultural expressions be modified mm-hmm. now see these are the questions that we uh, need to think about and discuss more yes maharaj so should i summarize maharaj or if you would like to add something more yeah so we discussed on the topic of bhakti pro modern and anti modern and we took modernity we we started with what is modernity could we could discuss different areas of life such as politics economics but we focus more on values and say freedom individualism equality rationality so we took the i think we we were a substantial time to rationality and how ati sarvatra varjayat you said that if rationality is uh, is made into the supreme value that self critical attitude the attitude of questioning and rejecting tradition that has led to the modern cancel culture and it will go on uh, destroying whatever has come before it and that's endless and that happened in european history also where the protestants kept endlessly dividing because they rejected authority and uh, so then we discussed that rationality itself is uh, compatible with uh, with the principles of bhakti in the sense that we can make a rational case and we can also use rationality so aligning rationality means that we utilize rationality to explain and to understand spiritual truths and then we use it to explain spiritual truths to others uh, so at the same time you know those who are who become purely devoted to rationality they will reject everything else as irrational and they will respect reject spiritual truths also as irrational but we could differentiate between irrational and transrational and rationality itself can't disprove the existence of transrationality so so there is a modern thought the attempt to make say the transrational or the spiritual subjective rather than objective then we discussed about how in one sense our fundamental experiences are subjective not objective so as we move from grosser mathematically measurable to intangible then they become more and more subjective so the bhakti tradition offers us certain resources by which different subjects can have the same higher spiritual experiences in that sense there can be an objectivity that there is a shared subjective experiences could be called as objective and um, so so then after discussing how rationality can be used or rationality can be harmonized aligned with spirituality with bhakti then we move to the other side looking at the components of bhakti with respect to philosophy and then culture and then the core propositions of bhakti philosophy can be a rational case could be made for presenting them 
but the rationality alone taken as the two extreme will not be compatible and then you made a very significant uh, differentiation with uh, analysis of the relationship between philosophy and culture that they are we could say organically related with each other and uh, the philosophy philosophy is more like the foundational world view then there is a inner expression of the culture in, in the, there is an internal dimension of the culture in terms of values and there is a outer expression of the culture so there are many, many there are many permutations possible that say somebody can have a non theistic philosophy and they can have the value of humility somebody can have theistic philosophy and have the value of humility but non theistic philosophies will the values will not be sustainable among those who have it and the non theistic philosophies don't provide transformational tools for the development of those values in those who don't have it right now but the theistic philosophies do and then we talk about the external aspects of the culture which may external expressions which may vary so how humility and modesty for example uh, or dietary choices are expressed may vary from person to may vary from culture to culture but if the fundamental values are assimilated and our education can focus more on not on specific practices and debating them because that can seem to be infringing on freedom but on on establishing the importance of those values then devotees will have some resources to to navigate modernity and if we have at a level individual sincerity then krishna will guide us from within and these are as you said nuanced issues with what can be adjusted what can't be adjusted and also you mentioned that just because something is in detail it doesn't mean it is not important so we can't just casually neglect the details we may have to seriously consider how those details are to be adjusted but not that they simply be rejected so bhakti so the overall we could say that it's uh, it's nuanced the interaction with bhakti and modernity and bhakti ultimately is transcendental so it's not anti modern pro modern it is trans modern because bhakti is a eternal relationship of the soul with krishna and modernity is a as you said a temporal construct so how that transcendental uh, transcendental expression of the human heart can be expressed in modernity that would be something which would be a both a individual and a institutional journey for us to navigate any concluding thoughts or anything i left out maharaj yeah just one point i think that while we emphasize that inherently bhakti is transcendental and mm-hmm. therefore uh, not subject to uh, terms like modern or ancient mm-hmm. because it is on time uh, at the same time uh, certain philosophical understandings or cultural expressions may not be aligned to contemporary beliefs and practices yes. some may be aligned some may not be aligned so mm-hmm. at one level we say that the the question of bhakti being pro or anti modern is infructuous but on the other hand we say that the principles and the practices of bhakti may be aligned or may not be aligned with contemporary mm-hmm. views and, and beliefs and then we have to see how we can present that in the way that the contemporary generations appreciate and understand uh without changing the main structure yes of philosophy and culture yes ma'am right? thank you very much this is a very thought provoking and i think significantly deep discussion thank you for so your sparing your time and sharing your wisdom maharaj thank you very much thank you it was a nice discussion hari krishna hari krishna thank you